Well, welcome everyone to the Eastwood Workforce Solutions Employer Spotlight Information Session. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rhonda Pryor. I am a business liaison at Nova Works Business Services. It's my pleasure and privilege to host our webinar today. And we're so very excited that you could join us. We have an hour to cover a lot of great information. And, but before we get started, our agenda, we wanna walk you through that very briefly. For housekeeping rules, after I share some of those, we will begin, We will start with our featured employer and wrap up with some final thoughts. Um, as for housekeeping rules, closed caption live transcript is available for this webinar. Click the closed caption live script button on your Zoom screen and select from the pop-up menu how you want to view the transcription. This webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on the NovaWorks YouTube channel. To limit distractions in our virtual environment, we have muted everyone. For those of you participating online, you can present your questions in the chat feature. Um, and if you get bumped off the internet at any point during our webinar as an alternative, you can call in to hear the rest of it. Also during our webinar, we're gonna be conducting some anonymous polls. So we encourage you to participate and share your perspective. Well, at this time, it gives me a great pleasure to be able to introduce our featured speakers for today. East Ridge Workforce Solutions is a newer employer we are collaborating with. However, there is a connection from the past and we'll soon learn more. Jackie Lee Nakayama is a national professional recruiter with East Ridge Workforce Solutions. Although she has been in the staffing industry for over two years, Jackie has actually been recruiting talent for over eight years. Her primary goal is to ensure the quality of experience for her clients and her candidates. Jackie enjoys the thrill of becoming part of her candidate success stories, whatever success means to them. Evan Levine serves as the Director of National Accounts at East Ridge Workforce Solutions. He has been with East Ridge for six and a half years and oversees their strategic national hiring efforts for all levels and disciplines. We are so excited to be welcoming East Ridge Workforce Solutions for the first time. Let's welcome Jackie and Evan. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning. All right, so let's get our presentation up. There we go. All right, so thank you guys for joining us today. We were really excited to, you know, introduce ourselves and to talk about Eastridge and to talk about uh, um, what trends we're seeing in the marketplace and what the and you know what the job market looks like. Um, so with that said, um, I will turn it over to Evan to kind of kick things off. Awesome, thank you, Jackie and Rhonda. Thanks so much for having us and for everyone who joined today. I'll try not to spend a ton of time talking about us because it's, that's really not the point and really focus on, yeah, the job market, definitely really interested for uh, participation throughout uh, today so we can add as much value as possible. Um, but I certainly will tell you a little bit more about Eastridge. We certainly would love to be a resource to everybody here in any way possible. Um, so Jack, if you want to go over to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll just tell you everyone a little bit more about us. So there's a, a good uh, concept of kind of who we are and what we do. So again, we'll start there, talk about trends, kind of talk about tips uh, with uh, working uh, with us and everything. Um, Jack, if you want to close that bar at the bottom uh, to uh, with uh, other candidates that you've been uh, impacting in a great way, um, well, we'll talk about tips with working with us in Q&A. So some company profile is, uh, you know, so we were founded in 1972. Um, we're actually an employee owned company, which is something I think is just gives us um, a different feel. Uh, at least I know personally, I could speak to that. We were actually family owned and operated for 47 years until we uh, became an employee owned company uh, just recently. Um, our NPS score of 62 in the first quarter of this year is much higher than the average of 28. We do operate in uh, about 25 different country, countries and reach about 80% of the globe. We have 300 plus internal employees. Uh, over 1,300 clients, and we're connected to 
over 125 other recruiting companies to just build more connections for our candidates, certainly our clients too. Um, some of the things we're proud of is to be named you know, in Forbes, um, 100 best uh, professional recruiting firms, you know, top 1% in staffing and industry analytics. We're headquartered out of San Diego, actually where I sit, um, and uh, we're named one of the best work, uh, uh, workplaces to be. And we partner with a number of charities and veteran uh, partnerships as well, like the Honor Foundation. Um, we're really proud of our Glassdoor rating too. We, we like working here, so we think that's important. Um, and this is just a good snapshot of our areas of focus. So on the top, you can see just the types of recruiting we do from professional to volume, payrolling, RPO, and our managed service provider type of support. Those are the types of recruiting we do. And the industries below, I won't read all them off, but those are where the majority of the work or types of organizations that we work with are. We certainly work with others outside of that, but the majority of everything we do falls within those particular types of uh, industries. Just a little bit about kind of our, our scope or just, uh, again, type of size. Um, I, I, the reason I like working here, to be totally honest, is you know we're big enough to do a lot of really exciting things, but we're still small enough where um, you know, you can make a deep impact. You know, all of us are really a call away. No one, no one's calling an 800 number to try and get a hold of anybody. So I think that's just really important from everyone's experience. Um, you know, in 2020, we placed over 30,000 people. For anyone interested, you know, we do facilitate contract, temp to perm, and permanent work. Um, and we do have a national focus. That's kind of the team that Jackie and I are on. But you know, she's based out of the Bay Area and. Again, over 51% of our placements in 2020 came in California um, and about a thousand of those were in the Bay Area. So um, we definitely have that type of um, focus while still being you know, spread out for our clients across the country too. Cool. And last slide about us, I promise, uh, is just again, a, a focus on uh, the types of recruiting like verticals that we have specialties in. Um, these are really the areas of focus for anybody on the call that you know kind of falls into one of these categories or, or maybe not um, uh, that we have specialty recruiters in these areas. So it's really important to us that throughout the majority of our business, we have individuals who come from these backgrounds and recruit in these spaces and just understand those worlds um, and help connect um, individuals like yourselves with uh, companies in those spaces. So we really do like to maintain specialties across the organization. And these are the main areas of focus that our recruiters tend to operate in. Okay. I guess I'll pause there if there's any questions in the chat. Um, uh, apologies, it's, I can't see anybody. So um, if there's any questions that anyone wanted to throw in the chat, I can pause here to, to see if anyone has any before we move into the trends. At this time, we do not have any, Evan. Cool, okay, go ahead, Jackie. Okay, so I am covering your trends. Um, so, you know, everybody's asking about what jobs are hot, what skills are on high demand. Um, now the jobs that um, I, you know, that we are seeing um, a lot of are things in software development and engineering. Uh, specifically in the QA and QC space. Um, all customer service is opening up. Now, granted, this isn't necessarily face-to-face -face customer service. This is more B2B, B2C uh, kinds of customer service or field uh, sales. So, you know, there is, a, you know, an opportunity for those individuals to work remotely, um, but it's not your traditional customer service. And customer service in and of itself is a very wide field. Uh, that covers a lot. So keeping that in mind. Um, engineering, uh, primarily in manufacturing uh, and projection industries, um, because we are seeing more states, more cities opening up, um, you know, that is a really heavy need that we're seeing, as well as recruiters and talent acquisition uh, roles. So, because uh, again, cities and states are opening back up, and all these companies who had to reduce their headcounts in 2020, they are looking to build their headcounts back up and they need support in their recruiters. <laughs> so, uh, so we are seeing a big trend in that. Now going over skills that are in high demand. So 
you know, in talking about those types of specialties that each one of our recruiters uh, specialize in, it's quite a big, you know, list. It is a huge diversity in which we are able to recruit in. Um, so there is a variety. Um, it depends on position to position. Um, what we look at is hard skills and soft skills and what, you know, what is going to be more important to each opportunity. Your hard skills are going to be things that are going to be a little bit more black and white. Um, so something like software, mechanical knowledge, um, you know, in some cases it could be education. Like for instance, if I am looking for a lawyer, I want to make sure that they actually have a law degree and have passed the bar in the state that they're practicing. Um, or it could be just years of experience within um, a specific industry or, uh, you know, doing a specific position. Um, now, soft skills, those are a little bit harder to kind of nail down. Um, now, what we look for in are going to be your inter interpersonal communication and organizational fit. Um, you know, keeping in mind that that is going to be hugely important, especially if you're looking at remote or hybrid work, um, because uh, the fact is, is that in those types of opportunities, um, you're not able to be in the office every single day. And so employers are really looking for people who are effective communicators, who can organize and prioritize the, uh, their tasks. And that is something that, you know, they're going to be asking. I mean, in terms of when you, when we do intake calls with our clients, we're asking them the top skills that they're looking for in their candidates. And so with that said, the top answers that we get are people who are troubleshooters, problem solvers, critical thinkers, people who are multitaskers and can and prioritize their day effectively, um, people who are a good fit within the organization or their team, which will involve being able to communicate and use tools effectively um, so that they're able to discuss uh, um, <clears throat> the progression of their projects um, and to address the issues that regarding the teams or what or what's on their work desk. Um, and then again, really, really importantly, uh, personal accountability um, is going to be really important, especially working remotely. So keeping that in mind. Um, now in terms of gaps in your resumes, um, COVID related uh, care, or furlough, the reason why I placed this question up here is because that is something that we are seeing more and more of because 2020 and COVID did that to a lot of people. Um, so you are not, you know, if you're somebody that has a gap in your resume, you're not the only one. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, so the most important thing when addressing gaps in your resume is to, you know, make sure that you are, first of all, make sure that the, the employment dates that you've listed are accurate. Um, and so also from your resume to your LinkedIn, right? Because the recruiters were not only looking at your resume, but we're also gonna take a sneak peek at your LinkedIn. Um, so making sure that those match up. Additionally, um, you know, be honest about that gap in your resume. And to, um, what we like to ask is, okay, well, how did you spend your time during that gap? Um, you know, candidates, they'll more popularly um, they'll take classes, take uh, uh, learning development opportunities. Um, some of the candidates that I've worked with, they've done uh, part-time side businesses or personal projects, or they've done contract work or consulting. Um, I know that there are some candidates that don't necessarily list um, if they've done contract or consulting work um, in those uh, small periods um, where they list a gap, but making sure that when you're talking to a recruiter that you are addressing that, yes, I was actually doing consulting or I was, the, or I was working on a contracted position. Um, in that case, making sure that you, you know, provide the scope of the position of the project that you're working on, uh, the achievements that you may have uh, been able to gain uh, during that experience and whatever metrics or what you were being held accountable for. Um, additionally, you know, any situation where you are able to continually um, develop or maintain your skills is going to be really important. 
And I can comment here too, Jackie, I think to, you know, to go back one slide and just um, for, for everybody looking for um, uh, a new opportunity while you go back, um, if you're focusing on, hey, who's hiring right now? Who's uh, in, uh, where should I target? Um, the two biggest industries we're seeing with such a boom right now, uh, kind of based on what happened during COVID, you know, e-commerce companies are um, exploding continually. Now, obviously, so much of that shifted businesses um, uh, last year, and that trend continues. So anyone tied into e-commerce in a number of ways is huge. So if there's organizations with a big e-commerce present, that's continued to explode. If it's just an e-commerce company in general, anyone who's selling online in a big way continues to have a massive presence and just continue growth. Similarly, uh, distribution organizations, because that's become such a uh, important part of that um, like uh, equation. Um, any company that has a big distribution element, they've continued to hire and grow. If there's a, a company that has a really strong handle on that, you know, logistics, supply chain, those types of organizations, they've continued to grow and continue to hire. So if you're uh, looking for, um, you know, a particular role, companies in those industries have continued to grow. Similarly, um, you know, for anyone kind of more focused on financial organizations, you know, the, the lending market, and if anyone's tried to buy a house recently, you know, the housing market has been completely nuts, um, even more so than ever. Uh, lending and mortgage companies have continued to uh, continue to grow, and they certainly need uh, not just those on the front lines, um, you know, selling. You know, sales jobs have continued to to be on the rise across the board, but they need all that support across the organization too, uh, back office functions, support functions, um, anything like that. So those are two really kind of um, large industries we've seen a big uh, increase in. Again, e-commerce distribution the lending industry, um, and again, really then thinking of the support companies for those two, you know, marketing agencies and organizations have uh, had a big increase due to their support for e-commerce companies and everything in between. So um, hopefully that helps too, in terms of some targets for potential industries for new opportunities. All right, so salary and compensation. How has COVID impacted salary and compensation? Um, I can't say that it's really changed um, the salary compensation piece, or at least the salary piece. Um, the reason why is because the cost of living hasn't really changed. Um, now, granted, there are certain uh, positions or areas where, um, you know, clients have made a slight uh, change to the salary just simply because the position is going to be remote and they realize that that individual might not have to commute. Uh, but typically speaking, since the cost of listing hasn't changed for anybody, uh, we, we haven't seen a difference in the salary piece. Um, now, changes in the marketplace or the uh, employee-employer relationship, those are things that we've actually seen more changes in. Um, so keeping in mind, um, now, in terms of COVID and return to work, right? Um, there are a lot of companies that who have moved to hybrid or um, are planning uh, return to work more so in 2022. Um, there are other, you know, opportunities where companies have realized, hey, you know, these positions, they've been working remotely just fine. Um, so there is the so there is a little bit of a balance there. Now, there are certain positions that could never really be done um, so if you are working in the manufacturing industry, there are more often, uh, than not, you would actually be working on site. Uh, but you know, for companies where they've decided to move certain positions remotely, um, uh, we're able to recruit, you know, for, you know, from a wider spectrum and from a wider field, um, than we were before, um, previously, you know, they were looking at candidates who were just generally in that specific local, local market. Um, there are some opportunities that we recruit for that are remote, but um, they prefer to have a local candidate who is able to get to the office um, if need be. Um, but if the, if the position is fully remote, then 
uh, then we would fully state that. Um, now, as far as uh, returning to work on site, um, we have seen uh, you know, make it pretty significant changes in terms of like the work environment itself. Now working with Eastridge Workforce Solutions, right? Um, any company and work site that we will work with, we, you know, as part of quality and safety, we actually do physical site inspections um, to ensure that the site is going to be safe. Um, we also address CDC guidelines um, and their protocols and what's being followed. Um, now across the board, um, you know, for people that actually have to go on site, um, people or companies that actually do require um, that uh, uh, you know, either a COVID questionnaire is filled out prior to entering the site or a self-declaration. Um, there are sites that will do temperature checking um, before you are able to enter the site. Um, and also I know that I've had clients go as far as sending my candidates um, COVID tests in the mail prior to their interviews. Um, so these are all things that we are asking of our clients to see what, to, uh, what protocols that they have in place in order to keep our employees safe. Um, additionally, because in the light of COVID, um, a lot of companies are moving to the 10 paid sick day model rather than just the regular three. Um, because it, COVID, in order to not be contagious, you have to kind of wait it out for 10 days. Um, and then also what we're finding is that companies are finding really creative ways, um, especially within those remote and hybrid opportunities, they're finding really creative ways to engage their employees, um, especially because a lot of them are working offsite. Um, so whether it's fun Friday activities or uh, scheduling a team luncheon where they, you know, where they get to talk about uh, movies or have a theme. Uh, <laughs> I know that, you know, at Eastridge, we do things like that, like every Friday, where we actually have, um, we actually have the, a, a meeting scheduled, and they're all themed and dressed up. Um, we've had some amazing costumes <laughs> come through uh, during those. Uh, so it, it can be a lot of fun. Um, even if you are working remotely. And I, and I could talk to it, Jack, if you want to stay on this slide, I'll answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Actually, in, in reverse order, I think that'll be the easiest to do it. Um, and uh, just to quickly go through them then, uh, Laura, we do service the San Jose area. Jack actually sits, sits there. Um, uh, and actually, a lot of our team, speaking of this, um, especially my team, sits remotely. Um, it's a great example of the way that you know, our organization organization certainly has shifted like many others throughout this time. So we've seen an increase in a number of organizations shutting down their offices and going remote only. Um, we've also now started to see a number of organizations returning and investing um, in the type of environment. But I think we've seen updates to the workplace on companies, especially in the Bay that used to have the really kind of cool office space um, they, uh, they certainly have been, you know, downgrading those spaces. I talked to a client the other day that had, you know, one of the premier, very cool offices, they had a sauna on site and stuff like that. I think COVID and the remote work or hybrid work environment has taught companies probably not the most fiscally sound, um, uh, approach all the time. And so we've seen a lot of those shifts in that too. Um, to Jillian's point too, um, yeah, you know, we, we have seen some of those. I think the, the better question framed is, isn't maybe how COVID has impacted this, but like what's happening now? You know, what's happening today? Um, you know, fuel costs, everything are so much different today than they were, you know, a year ago. And that's, it's a, just a good point, I think, on how all of this is evolving constantly. So asking questions to your employers about, you know, how they're navigating this, what have they done, what changes do they envision continuing to put in place, and companies that have a thoughtful process into it are just really important, um, and moving that forward, and it really speaks to, we've actually started to see increases in compensation to, to the factors in that are 
that prior to COVID, the job market was in a very candidate friendly place where uh, there was, you know, really more demand than there was supply. So we saw, you know, continued increase certainly since, um, uh, you know, 2008 to 2012, where it took such a massive hit and everyone was so financially impacted. We saw a steady increase. Then when COVID hit, it was a um, obviously a, a very strong halt or impact to the workforce and individuals. But we've seen it bounce back quite quick, and part of that is because the the compensation um, uh, market was in such a strong place prior, so it came back very fast. And right now, in uh, certainly a professional uh, workforce setting, it remains in a, in a decently strong place. So if anybody on the call is getting pressed on compensation or salary or something like that, worth asking the questions as to why. Um, certainly if you live in California, you should know no employer can ask you what you were making most recently. They're not allowed to ask that. Um, you can certainly ask for the pay range or salary range and they need to provide that to you. Um, so that's again, some of the reasons why we've seen it remain in a strong place. Actually 35% of organizations last month increased their wages. Um, Entry-level jobs across the board increased by a dollar um, last month as well. So we're seeing that across the board. Um, I don't have the percentage in front of me, but it, it's something like 40% of companies increased like their equity offerings over the past month to uh, attract candidates in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Um, and I think, Nina, you asked an, an awesome question about considering the increase in remote working. How does the salary negotiation impact individuals who live in more expensive areas like the Bay Area? It's a great question, and we are absolutely seeing that come up where organizations who have moved to a, a remote work environment say, hey, we, we don't need them located somewhere specifically. How does that uh, impact who we hire? Um, we've seen, I have organizations that have different salary bands across the country based on location, depending on who they're going to hire. I haven't seen it so much where they're saying, hey, we're never going to hire anyone in the Bay. We're focusing elsewhere. But you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone here has a story like that because of it. Um, so I think in terms of salary negotiations, you know, talking about where you live and just being competitive with your local environment is important because, you know, you're, you're not going to get up and move right away unless, uh, you know, they're asking you to or, or you're trying to. But we are seeing um, certainly that that play into uh, into the, that type of negotiation. And I certainly recommend on, you know, knowing your market value, knowing you know, what you should be paid where you live because of the cost of living and uh, just what's competitive in your environment. Certainly as recruiters, we can help navigate that waters for you or that water for you. There's a bunch of just good info online. Um, honestly, places like salary.com are actually great, um, yeah, as simple as they are. Um, so that's certainly places um, or, or things that we'd recommend. Um, to uh, Sanjay's question, because of COVID, do companies find it profitable to move from high expense states to lower expense or move jobs overseas. Um, we haven't seen so much of the movement of like jobs over the past year. We certainly have seen the movement of locations or again, moving to that, that remote environment. I mean, it's, it's no um, you know, new trend to see companies either move out of California. Um, certainly we saw a big exodus of candidates or you know, individuals out of the Bay uh, over the past year. Um, uh, and that's something that we're starting to see of a, a trend. And so we're seeing companies take advantage of dispersing their workforce um, or locations to uh, less expensive areas um, or taking advantage of remote work environments, re remote first environments um, and, and stuff like that. Um, but we, we haven't seen a, a complete move to like, you know, offshore or anything. I think one of the reasons why is because um, again, now companies can't really get away with doing stuff like that as much as they could without it being such public information with, you know, just the spread of information. And I'm sure many are still doing it in, in other ways, but um, I think it's, uh, it, it's something that we're seeing a, a move maybe outside of California or maybe into other uh, markets. Um, to Anna's question about recommending negotiating salaries based on your local market, even the companies outside of the Bay, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you live in the Bay Area, but your company is located uh, in another market, I mean, you can't get, I, I mean, I guess I would say what works for you best, but like I'd imagine 
if you live in the Bay, you can't get paid what you'd be getting paid in South Dakota and still live in the Bay. So uh, it's, um, it's important to, um, I think, just talk about that. I think obviously it's no, no hidden, um, you know, you can't hide where you're living unless, you know, you're trying to actively move or something like that. But yeah, I think it's important to know what candidates like you, your profile experience are getting paid in your local area um, because that, that speaks to it, uh, to, to your worth. So um, again, if, if the company is located elsewhere and you happen to be applying to it to work remote, um, again, most re remote first companies have different types of salary bands based on location. So um, it shouldn't be something new to them. Um, uh, in that sense. Um, in terms of where our, our company is moving to, um, we can pull some sort of list and get a much more thoughtful answer to that, uh, to, to Carolyn's question besides Austin. Yeah, we've seen a big influx in Austin, but uh, you know now it's starting to die down a little bit because it's become so overpopulated. Um, we've seen a lot of moves to places, you know, Utah has been a big one for a while. Uh, even uh, like the Carolinas on the East Coast have started to pick up. Um, but again, places with some good infrastructure, you know, Minneapolis and stuff like that, that aren't overly populated per se at the moment, um, have continued to pick up. So um, we can definitely have a more thoughtful list put together. Okay. So working with Eastridge Workforce Solutions. So, okay, so the easiest part is, well, getting us your resume is probably the first hurdle. Um, you know, that that's always the first step, right? And especially because we are in staffing and recruiting. But I thought I'd kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and offer maybe some information regarding, you know, what we're looking for in a resume, how we're able to find you, uh, because I feel like that might actually be uh, more helpful overall. Um, so in terms of the resume review, sort of key points. Now we're going to backtrack a little bit and talk about how it is that people re review a job description. Uh, so when candidates uh, review job descriptions, primarily they're looking at what the job title, the salary, um, nowadays if it's remote or uh, on site, uh, the scope of the specific position, like whether or not I job, right? When recruiters look at a job description, we look at it backwards. So we actually look at the qualifications and so the requirements of the position. We wanna know the scope of the position. Does that actually meet the requirements? Does that make sense for the candidate that's being asked for? And then we look at the pay rate. Does that pay rate make sense for the job duties and the qualifications of that candidate? With that said, you know, when you're reviewing uh, a job description, what you're really looking for um, in that job description um, are going to be specific skills, technology, or industry specific knowledge um, that you can pull from that job description. That's what we're looking for um, when we're just baseline reviewing a job description. Now, keeping in mind, we also do intake calls. We work hand in hand with our clients to ensure that um, the mix of hard skills and soft skills are going to be met when we are interviewing candidates. But, um, but you know, when we're just reviewing the description on, it, on its own, kind of like a lot of candidates do, we're you know, looking at the specific skills, technology, and industry specific knowledge are going to be very important, which leads into how do we find you? So <laughs> keeping that in mind, um, when we are plugging away, you know, go, sifting through millions of resumes, literally millions, um, we are, you know, we're using keyword searches to determine initially if that person has the hard skills to do a job. So if, uh, you know, so if a specific position does require certain software, um, certain, uh, if it's manufacturing, uh, ISO, uh, certification or training, um, you, you know, industry specific knowledge that would be helpful or is a requirement of that position. Those are the things that we're putting in a keyword search first. So if your resume does not have that information in there, 
we're probably not going to be able to find you very easily. Um, you know, there are, you know, we don't use the job titles uh, because, I mean, unless it's something like really specialized and absolutely specific, um, we generally don't use job titles because, uh, quite frankly, there are items like, um, you know, uh, that fall into a customer service line that have a multitude of job titles. Um, you know, even uh, talent acquisition and recruiters, um, there are at least five, five job titles that my job falls under. Um, so the job title isn't necessarily helpful. It's really going to be the skills and experience of a candidate. Um, there are some positions that do require specific education. Um, again, if I'm looking for a lawyer, I want to make sure that they have that education and they pass their bar. Um, but, or if the, I'm looking for uh, someone with a scientific background um, who needs to be working in a laboratory environment, they, they probably have to have that. But otherwise, we will be looking at your experience um, overall as well. Um, the other um, thing is when we're reviewing when we're reviewing your resume, we're actually going to be looking at the formatting, layout, grammar, um, the length of your resume. Um, so here's the thing. Um, we want, you know, typically you don't want your resume to be longer than like two pages. Um, and especially if you are someone who is looking to get back into the job market or is transitioning, you wanna lead with your skills. You wanna lead with the highlight um, because unfortunately hiring managers, they, they don't have a very wide attention span. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that we're leading with the good stuff um, on that resume. Um, we wanna also make sure now, in terms of like the durations of work experience, again, making sure that, um, that uh, your employment dates are accurate are going to be important. If you have a bunch of uh, contracted um, work uh, that you did back to back, um, maybe having more of a skills-based resume and then listing the specific work experience, um, you know, as kind of a small note to the overall experience that you have, um, that might be helpful. And that's something that can easily be done with in formatting. But it really depends if like you're, uh, it really depends on the position itself. Um, now, Following up after we've submitted a, a resume, so either you have a specific uh, job position, do the recruiter's contact information, contact them within 48 hours. If they haven't called you within 24, it's a little unusual. Um, if you are someone that is, you know, just kind of lightly browsing or you, or you haven't really quite committed, but you want to make sure that you're, um, that you, you want to address that you are available for new opportunities. Um, I would say, you know, reach out to that recruiter within, you know, once a week, just to kind of update them with what's, uh, what your needs are, um, to make sure that you're having that open communication. Um, something that's really important when you're working with the, uh, one of our recruiters is not only, you know, talking about uh, your experience and, and, you know, making sure that uh, your resume is well formatted, uh, but also addressing when you're available to conduct an interview. Um, we find that it is a lot easier and more streamlined if we have the ability to accept uh, interview times on your behalf. Um, so, keep, so say, I'd like to submit somebody for a specific job. I'll ask them when they're available um, within the next week uh, to go ahead and schedule an interview. Um, if you give the very specific timeframes, it makes it a lot faster for you and the client uh, to be able to get that scheduled out. Um, what to expect during your interview. So regardless of whether the interview is going to be on the phone, video, or in person, um, 
the one main key piece of advice that I give and um, that I pretty much give to junior high school students and high schoolers that are going through midterms and finals, it, it's pretty much the same. This is not the time to cram. <laughs> you know, you, you kind of go into those uh, situations knowing what you know and not knowing what you don't know. Uh, make sure that your resume speaks clearly to the experience that you do have because that is going to be important um, because you're going to be questions on that experience. You know, with interviews, they are really all about you. We want to know, we want to get to know you. We want to get to know your experience. Um, you you want to be able to be comfortable in talking about that experience and also talking about your achievements. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say is that, you know, don't take your interviewer for granted ever. Um, so, you know, recruiters, uh, you know, as Evan said before, a lot of us are specialized. So you have experience recruiting for specific industries. And if you're, you know, interviewing with a hiring manager, that is especially true. You, you don't want to ever take that person for granted. So, you know, if they are asking you questions about your experience, you want to make sure that you are able to walk through those processes, uh, talk about to the, you know, how you would troubleshoot an issue or how you would go about solving a problem step by step. Um, because yes, that person does, you know, probably has years worth of experience under their belt in the exact industry that you want to work for. They probably have done your job or the job that you are interviewing for at some point. But when you think about it, when, you know, before I talked about hard skills and soft skills. So when a interview is asking you, you know, how would you do something? You do still want to go step by step because it tells us a few things. It tells us that you you know how to do job. It tells us that, that the, the process or with how that company currently does, um, which you know is something that works well in a team dynamic. So it is very important that you still go through those steps. Um, now. You know, after you've done your interview, you get to breathe, you get to, you know, relax. Um, before you relax too much, you want to make sure that you send your interviewer a thank you note, just as, um, you know, thanking them for their time um, and, you know, asking them if there are any additional questions that, um, that they might, to, you know, want to pose to you or if there's anything that, you know, you can do as a candidate to, uh, make this choice easier for them. Uh, because to, you find that, especially with, uh, you know, hiring managers and uh, they go through so many resumes, they interview so many people, the people that they tend to remember more are the, per are the people that reach back out and say so much or, um, or, you know, try to uh, connect with them on LinkedIn those are the people that they'll actually remember more so than the person that didn't do it. Uh, so make, so that follow-up is very, very important. And also if you are working with someone like Eastridge, um, following up with that recruiter as well uh, to get feedback for how that interview went and the next steps. Amazing. Here, Jackie, I can answer through some of the questions mm -hmm. and I'll, um, I'll start from the top um, and then go down. I sorry, I, I I just realized not all of these are uh, um, listed and available to uh, all attendees. It just goes to panelists, so I'll read them out loud um, as well. Um, I, I do see Laura's question on just where to send a resume. Um, uh, afterwards, we'll show Jackie's email, and you can send it to her directly. And to um, uh, one of the uh, other questions uh, below to Mary Ann, um, we'll get it to the right place. Uh, to make sure it either goes, um, you know, to the right specialist uh, or anything, we'll we'll completely take ownership and, and handle that. Additionally, I just posted in. Um, oh, sorry. Let me send that out to everybody. Um, 
uh, just through our website uh, for, you know, a portal for job seekers, you can apply directly to, um, you know, over 180 roles on there. And again, those are run the gamut of everything that we do as an organization. So you'll see a number of different roles there um, that might pertain to you or may not pertain to you or be in particular locations. Um, so you can apply to any of them there. And again, if you see, if you don't see something, you can certainly, again, send your resume to Jackie um, and uh, you'll, we'll be able to make sure you're connected with, with the right person in any way. Um, in terms of top five clients uh, for Jim's question, it, it kind of depends on how you look at that. I mean, top five for us might be in the ones we do the most business with. Um, top five, just in size, you know, you could categorize it as, you know, places like, uh, you know, Western Digital or Rakuten and, and stuff like that. So um, I, I guess it would just depend on, on how you want to look at it um, because we, we do have a bit, very large um, kind of manufacturing distribution uh, part of our business too that works with big companies kind of like that. And then we work with them across all their divisions and, and, and other elements like that too. Um, I'm just going down the list um, in terms of Nina's uh, etiquette question. Um, if I got a job offer through a recruiter, should I send a thank you email to the hiring manager too? Um, I always say better safe than sorry, send it to everybody involved. Um, and to one of the other questions too, hey, you don't always have the hiring manager's email address. Um, I would certainly ask your recruiter, say, hey, can I get their email address? I'd love to send them one directly. Um, some recruiters will say, hey, send it to me and I'll forward it along. That's fine too. I always say, um, just, uh, just double check, make sure you know that it got through, ask them to confirm with you. Or again, if they can provide it, you can send it directly. Um, I'm very confident in uh, my team and all of our recruiters in making sure it happens. Um, I'm sure everybody has a story of working with a great recruiter and a bad recruiter. So just double check that it happens. Again, if you can take ownership of it, I'd recommend that because, um, yeah, you don't want that to get in your way if, you know, some recruiter you worked with doesn't do what they, what they need to um, and send it directly. Um, and, or, or have them copy you on when they forward it or something like that. So um, I definitely think better safe than sorry, send the thank you emails. Um, sometimes too, if you interview like in a group setting or you interviewed with six people in one day, um, if you have something particular to mention in your thank you emails to each of them, um, you can send them individually. If there's nothing particular like that to mention, it's totally acceptable to say, you know, you know, high team and send it to everyone all at once. Both are appropriate and it, it just depends on, you know, how you cater it. What I wouldn't recommend is sending the same thank you email to 10 people. Uh, if it's copied and pasted, then it, you know, it's not really uh, advantageous in that sense. Um, going down the list, um, can you give an example of different types of customer service roles? Um, yeah, absolutely. We our, our organization supports kind of anything and everything in between. So we support entry level customer service, um, uh, you know, working with candidates or working with customers through some of our clients um, in like face to face, like sales and customer service settings. We support, you know, remote kind of call center roles um, and or even on site like IT customer service and help desk. Um, so we definitely it runs the gamut in, in those types of um, yeah, we also have yeah, we support. Uh, account managers and, uh, and sales, uh, so B2B, B2C, um, which are considered customer service roles. Um, if you really widen the spectrum, I do customer service as a recruiter. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a wide gamut. Definitely is. Um, here then to another great question that, that James asked. Uh, what if we have different skill sets and want to apply to different jobs? And what about seeking a career change? It's a, it's a great question. And it's one of those really frustrating things, right? Where you know you can do the job, but you know when they get their resume, they're like, oh, you haven't done this before and they disqualify you. It's, it's absolutely one of the most frustrating um, experiences. And I think if anybody who's there has gone through it, 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 is, it, it absolutely can be. So I think one of the things to highlight um, is, you know, some of the, the transferable pieces. So for instance, if you might not have that industry experience, but you're say managing a team or leading a project, focusing on those task oriented items. So if in that new role, you're going to be responsible for, you know, like a, an implementation of some sort, 
talk about how you did an implementation elsewhere. It doesn't matter what industry it might have been or um, uh, something like that, or if the 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 skills of the job. Talking about that again, if you've managed a team before, and this role is is that, but it's in a different role. Talk about managing a team. Um, in most roles, they have a lot of similar um, uh, types of just. Uh, you know, tasks in a way, you know, did you complete something on time? Did you get it done before the deadline? Talk about stuff like that. Um, if anybody says, well, you've never learned this before, talk about in your last row, how you had to learn a whole totally new system or, or something like that and how quickly you got it done. That's one of my favorite re rebuttals to clients we work with when they say, yeah, but they've never used that system before. And I usually ask them like, hey, when you started, did you use that system before? So like, well, no, well, I learned it. it's like, great. Well, hey, in their last role, they picked up this new system, became a pro within, you know, a month. Talking about stuff like that is, is great to highlight. Um, and, I, and I'd always say just highlighting your skills in your resume are important um, because really your resume is just to make sure that, they, that you can get in front of them and then you can tell that story. So things like core competencies sections on your resume are something I love because it allows you to really detail right up top what some of those core competencies or skills are. And then you're not tailing your, like everyone says, hey, tailor your resume to every job. Well, I always say, if, if you've ever done that before, you know you're gonna go insane because it, it's, it's incredibly cumbersome and tiring. So, but you can change a couple of those core competencies at top without rewriting your entire resume, so. Um, and I find that that core competency section to be really helpful when changing um, careers because you can you can highlight a couple of those things uh, up front. Um, just I mean, going strangely, down the... those are some of like my more favorite resumes to work with people who are in transition, um, especially because you know I, I I sit in front of clients and I work with so many different job descriptions and I and I'm able to really work with hiring managers is to uh is to what it is that they're specifically looking for um regarding both the hard skills and the soft skills um and so for instance i recently had a candidate who uh, was in retail management and she wanted to become a recruiter um so you know going you know call, giving her a call and asking her questions about her recruiting experience within retail management, which it is there, but her resume read as a retail manager. Uh, so making sure that she understood all of the, you know, all of what would be needed to do or to become a recruiter and then addressing her resume afterwards. Um, so that she under so that she understood what it was that she needed to add in there that she could talk about. Great. And yeah, I know we're, we're running uh, tight on time. So I'll just run through these questions quickly. Again, there's uh, Jackie's email address. And so by all means, yeah, if you don't see an opening on our website uh, and to answer one of the questions, we're, most of our jobs are filled through other means. So that's a way to, to get candidates in. But uh, again, if, if you don't see something on there, most of our roles are certainly filled with uh, direct sourcing, these types of referral programs, and a lot of things outside of just our website. So you can send uh, uh, resumes directly to Jackie or apply through anything there. Um, and uh, uh, again, to a couple of the questions, we'll absolutely help you refine your resume in any particular instance um, that, that uh, it moves forward uh, on. Um, in terms of some of the supply chain roles to another question that we recruit for, purchasing, sourcing, definitely all of the above. We have a particular uh, technical uh, manufacturing uh, or uh, technical recruitment team that focuses on roles like that. Uh, so if you send your, your resume to Jackie or look on the website, you can certainly, uh, will help connect you with that particular team. Um, another great question is offering any short-term skills enhancements for the specific uh, jobs. It's actually a really good question. We do a lot of that at a bit of an entry level. So we will help uh, run uh, individuals in entry level roles, uh, specifically in the manufacturing space through a particular uh, like uh, paid training program that, that, that's linked up with our clients. Um, uh, we, we certainly have other connections to um, you know, job training uh, or resume training um, services like this that, that we do. 
Uh, and I certainly you know Rhonda has some other good connections that she can take advantage of as well. Um, we certainly recruit uh, or have uh, organizations in kind of all over uh, the Bay too. And uh, great, I see some thank yous coming through. Um, I know we had some questions. There was a poll we had um, and I completely forgot about it. Uh, Rhonda, I don't know if you wanted to, um, to put that up now, but uh, I, I, was, I should have talked about this in the trends, but it's something that speaks to what we're seeing. I'm curious if everyone could answer, if you would decline a job opportunity, if you were required to work on site three or more days per week. Um, it speaks to a trend of just uh, varying answers that how, or the way this question has been answered over the past year or so has dramatically changed. So um, we'll leave it up for a second so everyone can answer. But again, the question being, would you decline a job opportunity if you were required to work on site three or more days per week? And I think the uh, the poll is up. You can select yes or no too. We'll go ahead and end the poll. Cool. And share the results. Okay. So yeah, it looks like we had fourteen percent saying yes, they would would decline that. Um, and, uh, and 40, 86% uh, say no, they would not decline that. So yeah, um, uh, we, we, we had another question about, you know, what would, uh, you know, if you selected yes, what would it be? But I, I think given most said no, then, you know, we, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to pull that one up. But um, yeah, I see, uh, you know, S Sylvia chatted in as an HR consultant, trend sword hybrid roles now, uh, and, and companies need need to offer that. It's it's a great point. A couple of people saying it's really about the commute, uh, and that really depends on on what's coming up. It, it's just you know if we asked that question six months ago, it was almost 50 50. Certainly last year, uh, rightfully so, it, it should have been skewed. And in different areas, we're still seeing that that um, a variety of answers come through, but. It's even, I don't know, to me, amazing. We can ask that question now versus so many companies being afraid of the, the remote or hybrid setting and then quickly got thrust into, um, uh, you know, having to, having to, to accommodate in a way. So, um, so that's certainly, uh, certainly something that we've seen change. Um, I know there were some pre-submitted questions we can get to um, uh, as well. I know we're, we're really, Kind of running into, yeah, we're running into time, but I think, you know, we can certainly tailor, um, I know we kind of already talked about uh, career uh, transitioning um, a little bit. Um, a couple of things that I think are important for this group too, you know, um, take on experience and education. Um, I certainly am a big advocate for experience um, uh, being highlighted if you might not have the educational requirements. I'd always say if you see there's a higher level of education required on a job description that you don't have, submit your resume anyway. Oftentimes from my side, I see companies that they'll definitely take education to supplement on experience for sure. And sometimes for some internal reason, they might say, hey, you know, someone needs an MBA in this because it fits the mold of the team. So it's not always a great reason sometimes. So I always recommend, um, highlighting the, if you, and if you have the education, highlight it. You should always highlight the education that you have. Um, and if you have the experience, sa same type of note, you know, it, it really does depend uh, on the organization and potential internal structure of that team. So, um, you know, but, but both can be um, advocated for, and, and it really depends on the internal team that you're working with sometimes um, in terms of, uh, responding to interview questions about contracting over a period of time. I, I always tell people to be honest. You know, I, I don't think you have to sugarcoat things in a way where if maybe you took on a contract and got stuck doing it for a while. Um, talk about that. And, but talk about how all the things you had to do to learn quickly on that job. Um, you know, you have to pick up really quick when you're contracting and being able to highlight that's important. 
And if you're looking for a long-term opportunity, letting them know you're looking for a long-term home. Um, certainly you can tailor your resume in a way too, where, you know, for the company title, you can put various companies and put, you know, the length of time you've been contracting in total and list out those assignments. So it might not look like you've been job hopping uh, in a way, which usually isn't the case. You've been taking on strategic contracts and uh, that might now be looking for your permanent home. So um, we certainly can, um, can help answer that question, you know, in each individual circumstance. And, um, you know, I always say you get, if you ask 10 people for resume advice, you always get 10 answers, but uh, what helps tell your story best uh, and then gets you in front of uh, a group for an interview is typically the best, uh, best solution. Uh, let's see, uh, the project program manager question. Okay, so it's a hugely competitive space. And I understand that they, that can be a, kind of a frustrating place to be in um, because project and program managers, uh, they typically have a very wide variety of skills. And things. Um, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes companies are looking for industry experience. And so making sure that that's highlighted uh, somewhere within like your summary or objective. Um, you know, to kind of help eliminate any sort of confusion. Um, but, uh, you know, because there's such a wide variety of what, um, uh, of what that experience kind of looks like, um, a lot of times uh, uh, in that body, you're going to put in like the leadership skills that, uh, uh, that you displayed during the, during the, uh, experience, you're going to list your actual achievements and metrics, um, because those are things that transition over from position to position actually relatively easily. Um, so, so I think that um, in terms of addressing that, um, you know, on my side, um, what I do is I tend to tailor my questions based on, you know, your experience. Um, and we are able to actually, you know, if you want to stay as a program manager, just to talk about the specific industry details that we might need to see on your resume, or if you're looking to transition out, what that could look like. Um, how best to respond to interview questions? Um, I think that is something that to Evan discussed. So were there any other questions that, um, that came through in the chat that we missed? Let's go ahead and, and wrap it up. And I really want to um, thank uh, both uh, Jackie and Evan for sharing their tremendous expertise with us today. Um, if you are interested in exploring opportunities with them, please outreach um, as instructed. Uh, we really do want to make sure that you know that we here at Global Works to support you as well. Um, so if you need some assistance with customizing your resume, please make an appointment with the Noble Works Career Advisor and take advantage of that wonderful um, opportunity. Um, in an effort to help us to continuously improve our um, offerings here through Noble Works, uh, what we're asking is that you be so kind as to complete the uh, Eastridge Workforce uh, Solutions uh, Employer Survey. At the conclusion of this uh, session, there will be a pop-up menu that will be displayed. Please click continue to share your thoughts and experiences about today, we would appreciate that as well as our panelists today. Um, also, we'll be following up if for some reason you're not able to complete it today, we'll be following up uh, in a day with uh, linkages to that survey. Plus also, if you are interested in receiving today's PowerPoint presentation, please select um, that option to say that you want that. We will follow up and provide that um, information to you. Uh, again, make sure that you stay connected to Noble Works. Uh, Noble Works is here to support you through this transition. Take advantage again of our uh, passionate career advisors. Uh, we have some great, informative, knowledgeable workshops. Uh, and of course, take advantage of that dynamic networking group called ProMatch. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate your contribution to today's presentation, and we look forward to servicing you. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you.